In this video I'm going to be covering how we get dose measurements using ionization chambers. This is the first part of a broader discussion on absolute dosimetry. Over the next few videos I'm going to be covering as much of the topic as possible, including the various kinds of cavity theory, ion chamber perturbation, and how we actually use an absolute dosimetry code of practice. If we want to use measurements to determine the shape of a dose distribution, so to perform relative dosimetry like measuring PDDs and profiles, we have a few options when it comes to the choice of dosimeter. But when it comes to performing absolute dosimetric measurements, so determining how many gray are actually contained within these dose distributions, we're limited to the use of ionization chambers. This is partly to do with the characteristics of this kind of dosimeter, mainly that their response doesn't change much over time, or with successive radiation doses. But it's mainly the fact that we as a field are devoted a lot of effort to working out exactly what sorts of corrections we need to apply to ionization chamber measurements in order to get accurate measurements of dose. An ionization chamber is a little container of air across which we can apply a voltage. When ionizing radiation passes through it, it does what the name implies and ionizes the air within. It knocks electrons off the atoms that make up the air, which separates them into charged particles, negative electrons and positive ions. Putting a voltage across the chamber causes one wall or electrode to become positive and the other to become negative. The negative charges tend to move towards the positive end, and positive charges tend to move towards the negative. We can measure the amount of charge reaching these walls or electrodes using an electrometer, which we connect to the ionization chamber. So an ionization chamber measures the charge generated in the air within by ionizing radiation as it passes through. The general idea is that more charge produced inside means that more radiation is hidden. In clinical beams, we normally obtain absolute dose measurements using an ionization chamber inside a water tank. There are a few key problems that we need to solve if we want to use an ionization chamber to measure dose to water. What we want to know is dose to a point in a water phantom, but what we can actually measure is charge generated in an ionization chamber volume close to this point. The charge isn't dose and a measurement obtained inside a detector volume isn't the same as what we'd get inside a phantom if the detector wasn't there. We need to be able to convert this charge reading into dose to a point. Getting a measurement of dose to a point in water from an ionization chamber charge reading requires a few steps. The first is to correct the measured charge to a value that more closely reflects the amount of radiation hitting the chamber. This involves accounting for the effects of ambient temperature and pressure, which can affect the amount of air inside the chamber, and therefore the amount of energy that it will absorb. Also correcting for recombination, basically accounting for the fact that not all charge generated inside the chamber will be measured. Some of the positive and negative particles will combine and not reach the electrodes to be measured. And also for chamber polarity, the fact that the direction of the applied voltage across the chamber can affect the reading too. I'm going to cover each of these effects in more detail in a future tutorial. We need to convert the measured charge into absorbed energy, so converting ionization to dose absorbed by the air in the chamber volume, then convert dose to air to dose to water, and assign the value obtained in the chamber volume to a point in the water phantom. Steps 3 and 4 are usually taken care of using the same operation, which I'm going to cover in more detail in the next video. Converting measured charge to energy absorbed within the chamber volume is theoretically quite simple. We multiply the measured charge by the known value of the average energy required to produce a certain amount of charge. This value is often written as W on E. The value that we've mostly agreed to use is 33.97 joules per coulomb. Multiplying these two values together gives us the energy. But remember, dose is the amount of energy absorbed per unit mass of material. If we knew the mass of air inside the chamber volume, we could just combine these two quantities in order to get the dose. This is how it's actually done at some primary standards labs that use cavity ionization chambers with a known volume. But unfortunately, it's difficult to accurately measure the volume of clinically used ionization chambers. So we find that using a calibration factor is a more accurate method. This involves sending an ion chamber off to a primary standards lab where it's exposed to a known amount of radiation as determined using a primary standard dosimeter like a graphite calorimeter or a cavity ionization chamber, and the ratio of delivered dose to measured charge is determined. This is the calibration factor. This can be used to directly convert measured charge into dose to water. It's an approach that allows us to get around having to calculate the volume of the ion chamber, but it does come with some extra difficulties in that the calibration factor is only applicable to the beam in which it's determined. This is usually a cobalt-60 beam, which can be quite different to the beams that we use clinically. Converting a cobalt-60 appropriate calibration factor to one that's applicable to our own beams is the main reason why we need dosimetry codes of practice, like TRS-398. I'm going to be covering how we can use a dosimetry code to do this in a separate video. In order to convert dose from one medium to the other, like dose to air to dose to water, we use Bragg gray theory. It's often poorly explained in textbooks, so I'm going to have a go at doing it comprehensively in the next video.